Years ago, someone brought to my attention an opinion piece in the New York Times by columnist David Brooks called Love Story. Actually, many people brought it to my attention. They all felt sure that I would like it, and it would be an understatement to say, I did. Every once in a while, you stumble across a story that speaks straight to your soul. This one did to mine, and I hope it will to yours. In it, Brooks describes a passage he came across in a biography of intellectual historian Isaiah Berlin that describes Berlin's chance encounter with Anna Akhmatova. Akhmatova was a famous Russian poet in the early part of the 20th century, whose poetry was unofficially banned by the Soviets in 1925, whose husband was executed, and whose son was imprisoned. It was after all this, in 1945, when Berlin was taken to her apartment. She was in her 50s and 20 years older than he. According to Brooks, Berlin met a woman still beautiful and powerful, but wounded by tyranny and the war. The next part I have to read to you in its entirety. Quote, by midnight they were alone, sitting on opposite ends of her room. She told him about her girlhood and marriage and her husband's execution. She began to recite Byron's Don Juan with such passion that Berlin turned his face to the window to hide his emotions. She began reciting some of her own poems, breaking down as she described how they had led the Soviets to execute one of her colleagues. By four in the morning, they were talking about the greats. They agreed about Pushkin and Chekhov. Berlin liked the light intelligence of Turgenev, while Akhmatova preferred the dark intensity of Dostoevsky. Deeper and deeper they talked, bearing their souls. Akhmatova confessed her loneliness, expressed her passions, spoke about literature and art. Berlin had to go to the bathroom, but didn't dare break the spell. They had read all the same things, knew what the other knew, understood each other's longings. That night, the biographer writes, Berlin's life came as close as it ever did to the still perfection of art. He finally pulled himself away and returned to his hotel. It was 11 a.m. He flung himself on the bed and exclaimed, I'm in love. I'm in love. Berlin would later call this encounter the most memorable night of his life. Akhmatova would refer to Berlin as her guest from the future. According to one article I read about the two in The Independent, she fell so much in love with him that she found herself, she said, going around as if the sun were in my body. I love Brooks's article for its touching account of this magical moment of love at first sight, or rather, at first communion of souls. But even more than that, I love his brief description of what had made such a magical moment possible. He writes, quote, Berlin and Akhmatova were from a culture that assumed that if you want to live a decent life, you have to possess a certain intellectual scope. You have to grapple with the big ideas and the big books that teach you how to experience life in all its richness and make subtle moral and emotional judgments. Berlin and Akhmatova could experience that sort of life-altering conversation because they had done the reading. They were spiritually ambitious. They had the common language of literature written by geniuses who understand us better than we understand ourselves, unquote. And then Brooks laments, quote, I'm old enough to remember when many people committed themselves to this sort of life and dreamed of this sort of commun communion, the whole great books, big ideas thing. I'm not sure how many people believe in or aspire to this sort of life today. I'm not sure how many schools 
prepare students for this kind of love, unquote. One of my single greatest points of pride is that my school, in its own way, absolutely does. I share this story with you for two reasons. First, the spiritual ambition, intellectual scope, and subtlety of moral judgment Brooks describes are my goals in teaching literature at my school and here today. And second, I thought Berlin and Akhmatova's single blissful night, the one that left Anna feeling like the sun were in her body, the night that neither of them ever wanted to end, provides the perfect backdrop for our next poem, The Sun Rising by John Donne. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, for each of our poems, I've chosen a visual image that I think suits it thematically, even if the subject's not exactly the same. This, for example, is an image of Mars and Venus called Allegory of Peace, and it can be seen at the beautiful Getty Museum in Los Angeles. All the visual images are listed in the back of your handout in case you want to go back and revisit them. Dunn's poems are a challenging first read, so I propose to do this one a little differently than the poems I introduced yesterday. I'm going to take it one stanza at a time, translating it into plain prose as we go, and then at the end, I'll read it in its entirety. This, by the way, is how I tackle poetry that seems intimidating at first, particularly if I have good reason to believe that the poem holds promise either because it's been recommended by someone I trust or because it's by an author I know and love, an author like John Donne. I read it all the way through, getting whatever vague initial sense I can of its meaning. Then I take it stanza by stanza, looking up the definitions of words that I don't know or only know tenuously. Then I consider each line, doing research if necessary, until it's clearly within my grasp. And finally, I put the pieces together into an understanding of the whole. I've had countless experiences of seeing a poem's meaning, at first dim and faint, rise majestically before my eyes, like the sun. If you want to learn more about my method, there's a, a course I offered, I mentioned this yesterday, um, called Making Poetry Part of Your Life, and there's a a description of it in the back of your handout. So, on to The Sun Rising by John Donne, which you'll find on page nine. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus, through windows or through curtains, call on us? Must to thy motions, lovers' seasons run? Saucy, pedantic wretch, Go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Go call country ants to harvest offices. Love, all alike, no season knows, nor climb, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. So in this first stanza, he's chiding the sun for disturbing them like an intrusive and uninvited guest. He tells it to go away and harass those whose petty daily cares have to be kept to a schedule. Love, he says, is timeless. It knows no season, no climate, no calendar. The hours and days marked by the rising of the sun are the rags of time while these two lovers are experiencing a moment blissfully eternal. The sun, an instrument of time, should therefore go away and leave them alone. Continuing the poem. Thy beams, so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. If her eyes have not blinded thine, look, and tomorrow late, tell me whether both the Indias of spice and mine be where thou left them or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear, 
all here in one bed lay. In this next stanza, Dunn takes the artistic device laid out in the first of the sun as a meddlesome intruder, disrupting a moment so perfect it is removed from time, and he plays it out, rhapsodizes on it, embellishes it in layer upon heart-stirring layer. First, he mocks the sun for its false pride, for thinking itself so powerful when he can shut it out with a wink. But then, still better, says he won't exercise that power because that would mean losing sight of his lover, even for a moment. Next, in a potent phrase that absolutely takes my breath away, he says that if his lover's eyes have not blinded the sun, it should go on its way to light other parts of the world. Some feelings are so powerful that artists have to express them in the highest possible moral and metaphysical terms. Often this takes the form of elevating some value above the most sacred of values, even God. These expressions are some of my favorite moments in literature. When, in The Miracle Worker, Helen Keller's parents tell Annie Sullivan that perhaps God didn't mean for Helen to speak, Annie responds, I mean her too. When the nuns at the convent where their beloved Cyrano de Bergerac pays weekly visits, express a desire to convert him, the mother superior says to leave him alone for fear that he won't come back. And in 93, by Victor Hugo, when three innocent children face a terrible death, the heroic Radub says that if anything happens to a single hair on their heads, he will get even with the eternal father for it. Annie's determination to teach Helen language, the nun's love of Cyrano, Radub's devotion to the children, each of them gives their devotions to their respective values emphatic meaning by placing those values higher than God. I put this line, if her eyes have not blinded thine, into the same sort of category. To capture his lover, her beauty, in this moment, he has to describe her as possessing a power greater than that of one of the most powerful forces in the universe, the sun. In this stanza, he goes on to say that then, having traveled the earth looking for all that is most exotic and grand, the sun should come back the next day and discover that everything beautiful that the world has to offer has been condensed and immortalized in this moment, in their bed, in their love. These lovers are made the absolute center of the universe, containing all things, stopping time, and possessing the power to blind the sun. And if that were all not all clear and emphatic enough, it will be punctuated in the last stanza. She's all states, and all princes I. Nothing else is. Princes do but play us. Compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth, alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. In this last stanza, he says that all that is important, valuable, meaningful, honorable, even real, exists within those walls. Everything outside of them is mere imitation. Then, after all his unwelcoming, mocking, condescending treatment of the sun, he offers one consolation. In his old age, the sun must be tired, and they've made his job much easier. He can now fulfill his duty to warm everything simply by warming them. For they, in this moment, are the whole world. You must have had a moment so blissful that everything on earth feels like a mere backdrop to it. 
the feeling that time has stopped and that all of life is condensed into that single moment, that nothing else matters. That's the feeling that I imagine Berlin and Akhmatova to have had on that magical night. And I can imagine them scorning the sun for bringing it to an end. Now that I've translated it, I'm gonna read the poem once more all the way through. As I do, think about Isaiah Berlin and that perfect night with Anna Akhmatova that he never wanted to end. Busy old fool, unruly son, why dost thou thus through windows and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motion lover's seasons run? Saucy pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys and sour prentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Call country ants to harvest offices. Love, all alike, no season knows, nor climb, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. Thy beams, so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink but that I would not lose her sight so long. If her eyes have not blinded thine, look, and tomorrow late tell me whether both the Indias of spice and mine be where thou left them, or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear, all here in one bed lay. She's all states and all princes I, nothing else is. Princes do but play us. Compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed, thy center is. These walls, thy sphere. I've, I hope I've helped you to make sense of and derive inspiration from this exquisitely beautiful poem. Dunn's poems are dense because they are layered with meaning and beauty. The depth of his insight, the brilliance of his metaphors, and the inventive beauty of his language can make his poems initially difficult and ultimately soul-stirring. Now, in preparation for our next poem, I have to acknowledge that love is not always bliss. Sometimes it's unrequited. Sometimes we are betrayed. Sometimes love fades. And these experiences, too, need a voice or an image. This is aptly called the waning honeymoon. <laughs> it takes a second to see what's happening there. Anna Akhmatova wrote, a po wrote about disillusioned love in a poem called In the Evening. When she wrote it, Akhmatova was married to the second of her three husbands, the poet Nikolai Gumilyov. The marriage lasted less than a year. Perhaps the poem was about him, and perhaps it reflects the reasons for their relationship's demise. We don't know. But in it, she expresses a muted, simply spoken, but I think still aching dissatisfaction with a passionless love. My understanding is that Akhmatova's poetry defies translation into English. Guardian critic Carol Ruins describes the original Russian as being crisply metrical, and the metaphors as being precise and unambiguous, making it impossible, she says, for translators to preserve both the imagery and the rhythm. She also says of Akhmatova's work, her small, astute observations of human behavior and concrete, everyday details are neatly laced in the original by strain-free rhymes. But in your handout is the best translation I could find of In the Evening. 
It's on page 11. There was such inexpressible sorrow in the music in the garden. The dish, the dish of oysters on ice smelt fresh and sharp of the sea. He said to me, I am a true friend. He touched my dress. There is no passion in the touch of his hands. This is how one strokes a cat or a bird. This is how one looks at a shapely horsewoman. There is only laughter in his eyes under the light gold of his eyelashes. The violin's mourning voices sing above the spreading smoke. Give thanks to heaven. You are alone with your love for the first time. I won't spend a great deal of time on this poem because I mean it as a segue into our next poem about bitter disillusionment in love. But I do want to say a few words about it. The first stanza sweeps us into the scene, a scene at once romantic and melancholy. We're seated in a garden, an aphrodisiac of dishes before us, and music in the air. But it is sorrowful music. The tone is set. Then we're giving aching indications that his love for her has grown cold. He, her companion terms himself a friend. There is no romance in his touch. He looks at her with a removed sort of admiration. He touches her with a passionless affection. And there is laughter, not love, in his eyes. And where do we see the ache in this? Her pain at his indifference? I think it's captured with subtlety in the longing that is conveyed by her observation of the light gold in his eyelashes. This is the sort of detail that we notice about someone when we gaze at them with affection. We see that ache again in the last stanza, in the painful juxtaposition between his coldness and the voice of the violins telling them to give thanks to heaven for their love. I think this poem is deceptively simple and moving. But in my experience, there is no more forcefully and dismally bleak portrait of the bitterness of a withered love, is that a motivating introduction? <laughs> than Thomas Hardy's neutral tones and some words played between us to and fro on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. I know. <laughs> That's the line that caught me the first time, too. Oh, my goodness. And a, and a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the God-cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. Yeah. <laughs> In the first stanza, the scene and its emotional tenor are established. It's winter. The sun is white. The sort of harsh sunlight that rather than illuminating things, blots them out. Dead leaves lie on the barren, starving earth. I love the description of the sun as being white as though chidden of God, as if God's displeasure drained it of all its warmth and all its color. And I love the doubly powerful use of the word ash. It is literally the tree from which the dead leaves fell, but the deadness of the leaves is multiplied by the connotation of ashes. This is a scene of bleakness, of miserable, lifeless desolation. But why? The answer begins to unfold in the second stanza. We stood by the pond that winter day. That we, we learn in this stanza, refers to two lovers. But something has come between them. His lover looks at him with an expression of rumination over all the troubles of the past. The next line, and some words played between us to and fro on which lost the more by our love. That one's a little tricky for me. 
but I take it to mean that their conversation has a detached sort of casualness and superfi superficiality that's not befitting of lovers, and that's made still more awkward by the fact that they were once in love. The next stanza is the one that my seventh graders fought over when they decided to shatter their parents with tragic love poetry at our most recent recital. <laughs> All wanted the opportunity to utter the absolutely devastating line, the smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. If ever you feel bitterness over the forced or insincere or withered affection on the face of one in whom you once saw love, or if you are ever reflecting painfully on the last breaths of a dying relationship, Hardy has given powerful words to your bitterness and your pain. The narrator ref reflects on that near-dead smile and knows in retrospect that that ominous expression of bitterness was the death knell of their love. The last stanza is at once wonderfully cynical for your bitter or cynical moods. I know we all have them. And psychologically insightful. The narrator says that after this bleak encounter by the pond, he learned the lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong. We don't know what happened, but we know that it was a devastating moment of disappointed romantic hopes. But he also says that the bleakness of the scene is shaped and colored, or rather drained of color, by his interpretation of what happened there or by what was to follow. Those lessons, he says, shaped his memory of everything about the scene, the sun, the tree, the pond, his lover's face. In meeting at night, the joyful anticipation of a rendezvous lent charm to the sea-scented beach. In neutral tones, the memory of betrayal turns a pond in winter into a desolate, colorless wasteland. I think it is inevitably true that we project our internal states into our surroundings, and I found it fascinating how this poem unfolds that truth. All right. Cynicism, sorrow, bitterness, and betrayal may all be part of life, but I've had enough of them for today. Let's move on to something much, much brighter. After immersing myself in neutral tones and in the evening in preparation for this talk, I thought, now I want a poem about endless love. Not just the fevered anticipation of love, not just a single blissful moment, not just a kiss, but true, abiding, passionate, eternal love. And I sincerely thought to myself, how I wish Tennyson had written such a poem, thinking that he hadn't, but he did. I'm going to start crying right now, and I haven't even started the poem. <laughs> I can't believe that I only recently stumbled upon this poem, and when I did, I sat in front of my I sat in my room in front of my computer, reading avidly with tears streaming down my face at the discovery. Unsurprisingly, it has rapidly become an all-time favorite of mine, and I look forward to sharing parts of it with you. It's called The Miller's Daughter. And strangely, if you search for it on the internet, what usually comes up is a four-stanza segment from within it, which, while beautiful and self-contained, does not even begin to do justice to the whole. That four stanza excerpt is actually something I had encountered many times before, but it was only in preparation for this course that I discovered where it came from. Thank God I did. I'm going to take you through this perfect poem, sharing my favorite moments of all. It was as difficult here to choose what to highlight as it was with In Memoriam, but I've done it. I really do hope you will read the poem in its entirety. My suggestion is that you find a quiet spot, snuggle up comfortably with it, and read it slowly out loud.
The poem begins as a man reflects on his memory of the miller, a smiling, portly, seasoned man with eyes that twinkle, lit up, he says, with summer lightnings of a soul so full of summer warmth, so glad, so healthy, sound, and clear, and whole, his memory scarce can make me sad. Already, with the beautiful phrase, summer lightnings of a soul so full of summer warmth, I knew I was dealing with Tennyson. And then, with a poet's evocativeness and efficiency, in a few short stanzas, he makes you love the miller, the sort of man whose memory, even though it forces you to recall that he is gone, is so full of joy that it can only make you smile. I should probably clarify that since this is a very long poem, there are certain parts that I'll be summarizing for you that aren't in your handout, and then I'll indicate when I get to the ones that are, that are there. We then see that the narrator, the man doing the reflecting, is an old man who is himself approaching death, and that he is indulging in these happy reflections as he sits with his adored wife, Alice, the miller's daughter. Musing over their whole life together, he says simply, have I not found a happy earth? Even just that simple line gets me. He says that he loves their life together so much he wishes he could live it all over again. And he says that he wishes they never had to be separated. When he reflects that all, on all that life has given them and all that death takes away, he says to his beloved, pray, Alice, pray, my darling wife, that we may die the selfsame day. Looking in her eyes as they sit together after dinner, talking over a glass of wine, relishing their autumn years. He feels even now like the young boy who first fell madly in love with her. I'm now going to read to you the first of three segments that I have included in your handout. In this section of the poem, he details delightfully endearing reflections on the moment that he fell in love. I will occasionally interrupt the poem to punctuate the lines that I find so particularly moving. But Alice, what an hour was that, when after roving in the woods, twas April then, I came and sat below the chestnuts, when their buds were glistening to the breezy blue. And on the slope, an absent fool, I cast me down, nor thought of you, but angled in the higher pool. Note that this is April, spring, and that it is the springtime of their lives together. The chestnuts are budding, and so are they, and so too soon will their love. He describes himself as having the carefree idleness of youth. He is but an absent fool. Earlier in the poem, he says, Ere I saw your eyes, my love, I had no motion of my own. But he says instead he swayed purposelessly, like those long mosses in the stream. But the first time he saw her, everything changed. A love song I had somewhere read, an echo from a measured strain, beat time to nothing in my head from some odd corner of the brain. It haunted me the morning long with weary sameness in the rhymes, the phantom of a silent song that came, went and came a thousand times then left a trout. In lazy mood, I watched the little circles die. They passed into the level flood, and there a vision caught my eye, the reflex of a beauteous form, a glowing arm, a gleaming neck, as when a sunbeam wavers warm within the dark and dimpled beck. If you could script the first moment you saw the love of your life, it's hard to imagine a better one than this. A love song, you know not why, echoes through your mind, coming and going from some corner of your brain, foretelling the moment to come. You are angling in a stream in the peaceful springtime woods. A trout leaps, leaving behind a glistening trail of circles on the water. 
and as they die out, the reflection of a beauteous form appears, like the reflection of a sunbeam. And the last stanza of this section. For you remember, you had set that morning on the casement's edge a long green box of mignonette, and you were leaning from the ledge. And when I raised my eyes above, they met with two so full and bright, such eyes. I swear to you, my love, that these have never lost their light. Everything about this is just glorious to me. I love the pure, verdant, vibrant life of the woods that he recalls as the blissful setting of their spring love. I love the magic of the moment their eyes first met. Eyes, he says, that so many years later still shine with the same brightness. I love that all of this comes to us as the reflections of an old man, still every bit in love, more in love today than he was the day that they first met. What follows this first section that I shared with you is a long series of charming and heartwarming reflections on the days that followed about how his mother, observing the change in him, thought, what ails the boy? For he had begun, he says, to move about the house with joy and with the certain step of man. What a wonderful description. No more aimless swaying of the willow. He talks about the time spent lying on the freshly flowered slope, his heart trembling and full of hope, as he watched the faraway taper flicker in her window, imagined her sitting by the lamp, and dreamed of a life in which he could be there, sitting beside her. For those who were here yesterday, perhaps the candle in that window reminds you of another poem. What happens next is the second of, of the three parts that I've shared in your handout. But when at last I dared to speak, the lanes, you know, were white with May. Your ripe lips moved not, but your cheek flushed like the coming of the day. And so it was, half sly, half shy, you would and would not, little one, although I pleaded tenderly, and you and I were all alone. Some scenes are more powerful for their wordlessness. He declared his love, she flushed, and it had begun. And slowly was my mother brought to yield consent to my desire. She wished me happy, but she thought I might have looked a little higher. But it gets better. And I was young, too young to wed. Yet must I love her for your sake. Go fetch your Alice here, she said. Her eyelid quivered as she spake. Alice, remember, is the miller's daughter. And the narrator is said to have looked down upon the mill from the mansion house where he and Alice now sit. This was a disadvantageous marriage, and his mother does not at first approve. This image is called Married for Love. And down I went to fetch my bride. But Alice, you were ill at ease. This dress and that by turns you tried, too fearful that you should not please. I loved you better for your fears. I knew you could not look but well. And dews that would have fallen in tears, I kissed away before they fell. How many of us can relate in some form to this moment? That longing to please, that anxious changing of dresses, as if there's that one perfect garment that will make all our fears about the moment dissolve away. I know I can. And it is so sweetly touching that he says he loved her better for those anxieties, and that he tried to kiss away the tears that welled up in her eyes even before they could fall. And then, one of my favorite moments of all. I watched the little flutterings, the doubt my mother would not see. 
she spoke at large of many things, and at the last she spoke of me, and turning, looked upon your face, as near this door you sat apart, and rose, and with a silent grace approaching, pressed you heart to heart. Talk about perfect wordless moments. That his mother saw the expression of love on Alice's face, and all her objections evaporated on the spot. That her response was to rise, cross the room, and silently press Alice to her heart. It's just such a quiet, beautiful moment. Next, he recalls their wedding, and he asks Alice to sing again the foolish song that he gave her on that blissful day that they were married. That song is the four stanza poem that you'll find if you do an internet search for The Miller's Daughter. It truly does stand alone as a work of beauty, even though he calls it foolish. In it, he says he wishes he could be the jewel in her ear, that he might war touch her warm neck day and night, the girdle around her waist, that he might feel her heart always beating against him, the necklace on her bosom, that he might rise and fall with her laughter and sighs. Recalling this poem, he teases himself for his sweetness and says that if he was forced to make rhymes then and if he talks too much now, she has nothing to blame but love. He then returns to the present moment, saying that though those vivid hours are gone, the result of them is that she is now like his own life to him, that she is past and present, all wound in a garland and wrapped around his heart. The poem then closes with the last four stanzas I've included in your handout. I think they bring to consummate perfection an immortal tribute to immortal love. Look through mine eyes with thine. True wife, round my true heart thine arms entwine. My other, dearer life in life. Look through my very soul with thine untouched with any shade of years. May those kind eyes forever dwell. They have not shed a many tears, dear eyes, since first I knew them well. Their bond is so close, their understanding so intimate, their connection so metaphysical, that he feels as if they should be one, as if she could look through his eyes and they could share an identity of soul. He goes on. Yet tears they shed, they had their part of sorrow. For when time was ripe, the still affection of the heart became an outward breathing type that into stillness passed again and left a want unknown before. Although the loss that brought us pain, that loss but made us love the more. That stanza took me by surprise. The affection of the heart became an outward breathing type. Did you get what that means? They lost a child. And though it made them suffer forever, a desire they didn't know they, they hadn't known before, it also expanded their capacity to love. The next stanza. With farther lookings on, the kiss the woven arms seem but to be weak symbols of the settled bliss, the comfort I have found in thee. But that God bless thee, dear, who wrought two spirits to one equal mind with blessings beyond hope or thought, with blessings which no words can find. Again, he believes that the conventional expressions and images of love, the kiss, the embrace, do not do justice to the fathomless depths of their love, the settled bliss. How many works of art are there, novels, movies, poems, songs, about settled bliss? About the moment of falling in love, there are plenty. 
about a lifetime of love? So few. And I'm so grateful to Tennyson for this one. They are two spirits who, through blessings beyond hope, beyond thought, beyond words, have been wrought into one. Which brings us to the final stanza. When I read this the first time, never having known it before, watching it unfold as I read it, it took me a long time to be able to recover myself enough to pronounce out loud the last three words. Arise and let us wander forth to yon old mill across the wolds. For look, the sunset, south and north, winds all the vale in rosy folds and fires your narrow casement glass, touching the sullen pool below. On the chalk hill, the bearded grass is dry and dewless. Let us go. Writing about the miller's daughter, critic John Oates says, quote, then together they go out into the sunset and die with the sun into the life of the day that never dies. It is a perfect picture of the sanctity of love in the home, making pure all the fires on the altar of the heart, unquote. Another critic writes, quote, that poem is one of the finest emotional poems in the language, true in its originality, tenderly beautiful in its imagery, life itself in its feeling. The poetry of married life is there expressed, perhaps for the first time, and so well that it might be the last, unquote. I can't believe I had never heard of it. And I can't believe it's not featured front and center in every anthology of poems about love. I have one more poem to share with you, but first I want to share something else as context. This last year, we lost a woman that I think was one of the most brilliant minds in psychology, and one who left a lasting impact on my life personally, Dr. Edith Packer. I had profound respect for Dr. Packer, so I was surprised how much my respect for her grew after I heard the eulogy given by her husband, Dr. George Riesman. He talked about the oppression she suffered in childhood as a Jew in Hungary in the 30s and 40s. He talked about how at 19, she saw the death camps coming and urged her family to flee. And then when they refused, fled by herself forever tortured by the fact that they stayed behind and died. He talked about her determination to become a lawyer, though her mother told her women aren't lawyers, and though she would be the only woman in her NYU law school class of 100 men. He talked about her dedication to and brilliant innovation in psychology and the clinical practice she maintained until weeks before she died at the age of 93. He spoke of her with reverence and love and still with the stoic manner I had always come to associate with him, only it was occasionally punctuated by irrepressible sobs that seemed to catch him off guard and shook his whole body. He adored her to the end. He said, I had always expected her and ardently desired her to live to be at least 105. The fact that she didn't has devastated me. For over 48 years, her presence filled my life, and now it's simply gone. I feel a great void. I thought of them when I read The Miller's Daughter. He shared his eulogy publicly, so I think it's appropriate to share part of it here with you. There was one moment that to me was more poignant than all the others that revealed the depth of his love and that relates to our final poem. He said, quote, as I've said, Edith's passing has left a great void in me, and my knowledge and commitment to reality and rationality have only made it worse. 
I know that Edith no longer exists as any kind of actual being. All that physically remains of her is a small pile of ashes. She no longer has eyes, and so she cannot see me. She no longer has ears, and so she cannot hear me. There just is no longer any she. But nevertheless, I pretend that in some way she still exists and that she can still see and hear me. And so I still talk to her every day. And when I'm alone, out of anyone else's hearing, I talk to her out loud. So I need Edith more now than ever as my psychotherapist in addition to everything else. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Still Dr. Reisman speaking. Until just this last Sunday, I did talk to Edith out loud in reality practically every day for almost half a century. And so it feels much more normal to go on talking to her, even if only in pretense, than to slam into the brick wall of the fact that she is simply no more. So what I think I'm doing is trying to tap the brakes gently, so to speak, and come to a smooth stop, if that's possible. I don't think that's actually unreasonable. I thought of this moment from the eulogy when I read our last poem, Christopher Morley's To You, Remembering the Past. When we were parted, sweet, and darkness came, I used to strike a match and hold the flame before your picture and would breathless mark the answering glimmer of the tiny spark that brought to life the magic of your eyes, their wistful tenderness, their glad surprise. Holding that mimic torch before your shrine, I used to light your eyes and make them mine. Watch them like stars set in a lonely sky. Whisper my heart out, yearning for reply. Summon your lips from across the sea bidding them live a twilight hour with me. Then, when the match was shriveled into gloom, lo, you were with me in the darkened room. Like Tennyson in our first stanzas of In Memoriam, refusing to accept that his friend is gone and indulging the fantasy that he will alight from the ship and shake his hand, asking of home, like Dr. Riesman in his eulogy, explaining why it is perfectly right and a necessity that he continue talking to his wife, though she is no longer there. The narrator of this poem uses the spark of a match and his lover's picture to try to feel her presence in the darkened room. This poem is so simple, and yet I think it captures a timeless and universal sort of yearning. The way we use a picture or a relic to try as much as we can to feel the living presence of someone who is gone. He sees the light reflected off her eyes, making them appear as if they were alive. He speaks to her aloud, yearning for her lips to answer. But it is when the match is extinguished that he can feel her, because it is the work he does to remember, his longing, his love, that keeps her always present and alive, there with him in the darkened room. We've reached the end of our journey. I said at the outset of these lectures that I hoped that these poems would not just be enjoyable on their own terms, but that they would enhance your enjoyment of the life experiences to follow them. That you will better appreciate those that you hold as half divine, that these words will help your heart to breathe a thousand tender vows, that you have learned to love the weight you have to bear because it needed help of love, that you will relish your walks along a sea warm sea-scented beach, 
that you will be inspired to offer love in the open hand, no thing but that. That you will feel how a kiss merges thought and feeling and soul and sense. That in a blissful, eternal moment, you will feel that nothing else is. That in your bitter moments, you will feel understood in the lesson that love deceives and rings with wrong. And in your lonely moments, understood for whispering your heart out and yearning for reply. And at the end of it all, that you will be able to claim a settled bliss and be able to say simply, have I not found a happy earth? Poetry helps us to see that all of this is possible. And I strongly believe helps us to realize the possibility. Thank you. Reading poetry aloud versus reading it? Uh, why I recommend reading it yes. aloud? Fo focus. <laughs> There's so, I feel like the world is full of noise, and, and it takes effort to commit yourself and absorb yourself in even the effort to understand a poem. So... Um, when I read The Miller's Daughter the first time, I read enough that I could see that there was tremendous promise in it. But in order to fully engage myself, I knew I needed to read it out loud. And so because I'm doing the Read With Me group, I actually recorded myself reading it out loud for the first time. And if you um, subscribe to the app, there's a, a free option that's going to give you guys access to that recording. Um, so I left the long pause in it where I could not read the words, let us go. Um, but I just have to read it out loud to, to engage with it at the level that I need to in order to um, derive that meaning and inspiration out of it. And sometimes reading it out loud is absolutely not enough because the language is so layered. If it's a beautifully well-crafted poem, there's so much craftsmanship that went into the choice of the words and the sound of them and the order. And, and so it's, it's not as readily accessible because there's so much to unlock within it. So reading it out loud for me is, is the first step, but then I, I usually have to go back and, um, and sometimes ask for help too. <laughs> okay, well come on up and ask questions if you have. Thank you so much for for sharing this with me.